passage for the sermon this morning will be in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 21. And if you have a pew Bible in your hands or in front of you there on the pew, you can find that on page 1,190. It's 1190 in the pew Bible. And if you all wouldn't mind, would you stand please for the reading of his word? Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you avoiding worldly and empty chatter, and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. And so ends the book of Timothy with the words, Grace be with you. And the word you there, though the book is written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, uh, primarily, and we seen, have seen a lot of that in this, uh, in this book, the word you there in the very last words of this book is in the plural. So God's unmerited, overflowing grace be with you all. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would all be drawn near to you and your truth today by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word and the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone is the power to save for all who would believe. To the glory of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And your church, and your household, Lord, may we be good stewards of all that you have given us. The greatest gift, the greatest treasure this world has ever seen you have deposited in your people the church to share with the sinner, with the lost, with the spiritually blind, with the spiritually dead. That it is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who came to this world created by God, stepped into the world in the flesh, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross as the Lamb of God, shedding His blood to pay for and take away our sin. And in power, and in glory, and in victory over sin, Satan, and death, rose again the message to the nations is that Jesus is alive ready and able to save anyone who would repent of sin and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This gospel deposit you have given us, Lord, help us to invest it, to spread it, to share it, to preach it, to believe it until the day we see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to have you help me a little bit today uh, as you turn in your Bibles. You're, we're going to be focusing on the very last verses of the book of 1 Timothy as we, we're finishing uh, preaching through this book today, going through the, the whole book. This is, this is part of the philosophy of our ministry here is, is primarily going through books of Scripture. So we're finishing 1 Timothy today. But I'm going to take us to begin with, keep your... Keep your Marker there somehow. Keep, keep your finger there, your thumb there, or a sticky note, or your, your book ribbon. Anyway, keep it there at the end of 1 Timothy. Turn with me, though, also to 1 Corinthians 15. As you're turning to 1 Corinthians 15, I just want to share with you, okay, the message today is church, guard the gospel deposit from 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 21. And the purpose of the message is this. Christians in the household of God, the church, are guardians of God's gospel, guardians 
of God's gospel. Matthias, I didn't do this. I uh, didn't set you up for this, but could you help me? It's a really simple thought. Would you mind coming forward for a second? I started, uh, we started the series when we started preaching through Timothy with a, something of an illustration. This is my watch. Um, it's a Timex, so it's not super expensive. But this is my watch. Would you please take my watch, and you can wear it. You, you can have my watch while I'm preaching. You already have a watch. Maybe you can wear it on the other wrist. Oh, that one's broken. Okay. So this one, at, at least that one tells time. That's good. Um, and then in a little bit, the, the thing is, I want you to have it. I want you to use it. Use it as, as, as you see fit. Um, and in a little bit, I'll ask for it back. But I'm going to keep ownership of it, but you can keep possession of it. Is that okay for a little bit? Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Okay. If it was a Rolex, y'all would be like, what's he doing up there? If it was a Rolex, you'd be like, what's a pastor doing with a Rolex? It must be fake. I don't have no Rolex. Christians in the household of God, the church, are guardians of God's gospel. But first of all, what's the gospel? What's the gospel? And I want to borrow as much from Paul as anyone uh, this morning as we begin this message. The gospel is, first of all, what is it? If you have your Bibles now, I've given you enough time to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. I just want to read together the first nine verses. This is one of the clearest definitions of the gospel in Scripture. We'll see another one later on from Luke 24 in the message. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, read with me. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. The word gospel, the original meaning simply means good news. Which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand. So, Paul did something with this good news. He preached it. His hearers heard it. They received it. And they also stand in it. But look at verse 2. By which also you are saved. Next word, if. Condition. (laughs) If you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. So, first of all, from, from the same apostle who wrote 1 Timothy... I want, to, I want to get this definition of the gospel here. And the gospel is your salvation if you believe. There's a condition. See, the gospel doesn't just save everybody universally. You have to believe it. You have to receive it. You have to hear it. You have to understand what it is. And give your life over to him. You see, he picks up here in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Oh, now watch that. Because Paul did not make up this gospel. It's something that was given to him. And what is it? Here it is. The quintessential, most important definition, I would say, of the entire Bible. That Christ... The Hebrew equivalent of that is Messiah or King. Died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried. And that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, a reference to dying. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So where did Paul get this gospel from? The very living Lord Jesus himself. So what is the gospel? Well, it is your salvation if you believe. But what do you have to believe? That the Christ, according to the scriptures, all of the scriptures point to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that he died for our sins. And he did not stay dead. He rose again from the dead. There is no other Savior. There is no other good news. There is no other hope 
of sin forgiven. Only in Jesus. And how powerful, how amazing, how wonderful, how glorious that not only did He die for our sins, but that He rose again from the dead, conquering death. So not only did He pay for our sins with His sacrifice, He rose again to give us new life. This is the greatest treasure the world has ever heard. What is the gospel? It is your salvation if you believe. What is the gospel? It is also the power of God. You can turn with me to these scriptures. I wanted you explicitly to have that one open. I, of course, I always encourage you, open the Bible. Anything I say, get it from scripture. Understand what we're, what we're doing here from God's word. Even as Paul just said in 1 Corinthians 15, twice, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, God's word is our authority, infallible and inerrant, living word of God in the Bible. If you want to turn to these, see how fast you can do it. It's like Bible drill. We're going to do Bible drill at VBS this week. I'm going to announce a verse, and you've got to find it. So church, you do that with me today. Find this too. But I'm going to go quicker through these. Romans 1.16. What else is the gospel? First, it's your salvation if you believe. Second, it is the power of God. Listen to these descriptions from Romans 1.16, and I'm also going to get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you're, if, you're, if you're furiously finding those verses in the pages of your Bible, please do. Romans 1.16, listen to this description of God's good news in Jesus Christ. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So what is the gospel? It is the power of God. What does Paul mean by that? I'm going to borrow again from Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 now. Going to 1 Corinthians 1. 16 and following. 1 Corinthians 1, 16. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, uh, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech so that the cross would be made void. For the word of the cross, now he's centering it on the gospel itself. The word of the cross, what is that? That for you to be saved, someone had to die. For you to be saved, for your sins to be forgiven, for you to go to heaven, someone had to die in your place. And not just someone, anyone, but Jesus, the Lamb of God, who committed no sin, the God-man, the man who is God, the perfect one. Would you die for a friend? Would you die for your enemy? Because Jesus died for us when we were his enemies. And that word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, he says in 1 Corinthians 1.18. So for people who do not understand, for people who are rejecting and rebelling, rejecting God and rebelling against him, they hear that someone had to die to save me and there's something in their heart and soul that rejects that. It's foolishness. And, and they think, man, there's got to be some other way that maybe I can go to heaven. There's got to be some other way that maybe I can have forgiveness of my sins. There's got to be some, something other than that. I don't want that. That's stupid. But there's something interesting here. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. You see, they're already perishing. They're dead in their transgressions and sins. And so they reject. It's like someone drowning out in the ocean and you throw them a a life vest, and, and they say no thanks to the life vest. They reject the very salvation they're offered by God. But in the positive, he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, but to those who are being saved, this message that Jesus died on the cross to save you, if you're being saved, if you're open by God's Holy Spirit drawing you near to God and, and your faith is, is looking to Jesus Christ for your salvation, if you're being saved, that message is not foolishness. It is, he says, the power of God. It is the power of God. It goes, it's like opposite extremes. It goes from being the, the most possible ludicrous thing you could ever think about, thinking about it as ludicrousness, to what? To God's almighty power to forgive you, to save you. 
For it is written, Paul goes on, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I will set aside, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And in just a few verses right after that, 1 Corinthians 1, 22, for indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God, the foolishness of God, if there is such a thing. Paul, I think, is using hyperbole here. The foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What is Paul saying here in 1 Corinthians 1? That the gospel, that the very message of Jesus Christ, our creator and our savior, is God's power and is God's wisdom. And it puts all human power and all human wisdom to shame and weakness because there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. But God can save us. What a treasure. What a glory. Even now as I'm preaching and thinking about the doctrines that we're going through, um, describing the gospel as your salvation, if you believe it, from 1 Corinthians 15, or the very power of God from Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 1. I, I'm, I'm even concerned as a pastor thinking, boy, I hope everyone out here right now is thinking of this as God's power and blessing and beautiful thing. I hope nobody, even in the hearing of this message, is thinking that's foolish. Because if you're thinking that's foolish, you're dead. But if you're thinking, I want that. I want the power of God and I want the wisdom of God to be saved. Then that is the very life-giving message that God wants you to embrace, to believe, and to hold on to for your very salvation. I'm gonna do a little quick illustration here before I do the last couple things that the gospel is. You know, sometimes people say, we all go through bad circumstances. And, and I, I don't wanna sit up here and, and, and keep going through all the bad things we've been going through even in our society the last few years. But if I just say that, y'all could list them already in your own minds. But even in our personal lives, we go through bad circumstances. And a lot of times people say, well, if God is good and God is God, why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he do something about, fill in the blank, all the stuff you've been watching in the news, from world war to school shootings? If God is good, why doesn't he do something about pandemics? If God is good, why doesn't he do something about war and famine and disease and all this terrible stuff that's around here? And when people ask that kind of question, they are usually wanting God to do something different. And, and I just want to say, y'all, it's as if if we would ask God that question and say, God, why don't you do something about, fill in the blank, his answer is, I already did. I already did the single best possible something I ever could have done. I sent my son to die for that sin. I sent my son to die for your sin. And my son is greater than the death you fear. My son is greater than this world. We say, God, why don't you help us now? Help us with our politics. Help us with the disease. Help us with famine. Help us with war. And he's like, I already helped you with the very power and wisdom of Christ crucified and raised from the dead. And if we reject that message in favor of some other temporal answer, we're the ones who are lost. God, do something. I already did. The gospel is your salvation if you believe. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel is also Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Colossians 1, see if you can find it. See how fast you can find it. Shame each other next to you. Like if someone can't find it, you know, say, ha ha, you can't find it. No, I'm just kidding. Help the person next to you find this. I, I'm just, yeah, silly, silly, silly human fleshly stupidity. Don't think that way in church. Look at your Bibles. Follow the word of God, right? Colossians 1, 25. The same apostle who wrote 1 Timothy 
of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. You see, where did, where did Paul get the gospel? He got it from God, and it's in stewardship. You see, I, I gave Matthias my watch, but I want it back. I, I, I said you can use it, but you can't keep it. I want it back. So you're holding it in stewardship, but it's mine. The gospel was given by God to Paul for stewardship, but it's not Paul's. The gospel was given to the church for stewardship, but it's not the church's. The gospel is from God, and it is God's. He never for one millisecond all of eternity relinquishes his ownership upon his message. It is God's message. So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, Colossians 1.25, then verse 26. What is it? That is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, or holy ones. What are saints in the Bible? They're, they're all people who have believed in Jesus Christ. They're considered those who are holy and set apart. Not super saints or super Christians. or different. No, it, it's the gospel of Jesus for those who are saved, the saints, the ones who are saved, has been manifested to you, verse 27, to whom God willed to make known, make known what? What is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles? And what's the riches of the glory of the mystery now revealed is what? Christ in you, the hope of of glory. So what is the gospel? It is that the king who died for you and the king who rose for you, 1 Corinthians 15, the king who, who has power and wisdom greater than the world can ever give you, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians, is now one in you and you have hope of glory beyond this life. He's in you now and you have eternal hope forever for the future. What is the gospel? Christ in you, the living God in the believer, so that you have a hope which transcends this world. You and I have a hope that is past and beyond politics and pandemics. You and I have a hope that's past and beyond cancer. You and I have an eternal hope purchased for us in Christ. And the hope of glory that we will live forever. That is the gospel. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. That's Colossians 1, 25-29. So what is the gospel? It's your salvation if you believe. What is the gospel? It is the power of God. What is the gospel? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the gospel? It is also for all nations. It's for all peoples. And I didn't just mis misspeak there. We, we use that term in a kind of Christian terminology. Some people think I don't know English. Um, it's not just for all people. It's for all peoples. And how can you use peoples? What does that mean? Well, it, it's, it's just like in Psalm 2, which was our call to worship today, and in Psalm 2, 10, 11, and 12, this is a psalm, a psalm that they used in Old Testament worship. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. This isn't just God's people Israel. This is everybody. This is the people who in Psalm 2, uh, verse 1, the nations, why are they in an uproar? And the peoples, oh see, I'm using a Bible word. Because in Psalm 2, verse 1, it says, the peoples, that means nations, different nations, devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear our fetters apart and cast away the cords from us. The world says it doesn't want God to be God. The world says it doesn't want Jesus to be their Savior. But even in Psalm 2, in verse 10, it says, now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, Worship the Lord, Yahweh, the I Am. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage, or worship again, do homage to the Son that He not become angry and you perish in the way for His wrath may, be, may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. And it bids all nations, don't reject God, but worship Jesus. 
Isaiah said, 8th century prophet B.C. Isaiah said in Isaiah 49, 6, quoting Yahweh God, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. See, even in the Old Testament, we see prophesied that the salvation of Almighty God is to go to all peoples. And in the Great Commission, spoken by Jesus on the day he was raised from the dead in Luke chapter 24, 44 through 47, on the day Jesus is risen from the dead, it says in Luke 24, 44 through 47 that he opened their minds, the disciples' minds. The disciples are gathered in a room with the women who went to the tomb in the morning and the two men who went on the road to Emmaus and turned around and came back to the apostles. So the women, the two men, the apostles are all gathered together. Jesus appears before them physically resurrected after this is Sunday morning after he was crucified on Friday. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is my prayer. This has become... A, it's such a core verse in my heart, life, ministry, and everything that I, that I believe God has called me to do as a pastor. And I pray that God would open the church's eyes and mind and spirit and soul to understand the scriptures. Open our eyes, O oh God. Open our minds to understand. Thus it is written that the Christ, now I hope you've turned to this, Luke 24, 44 through 47. Turn to it. That the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. What is this gospel? It's your salvation if you believe. What is this gospel? It is the very power and wisdom of God. What is this gospel? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is this gospel? It's for you if you're a Muslim. It's for you if you're a Buddhist. It's for you if you're Hindu. It's for you regardless of the color of your skin or the language you speak. The Creator God who made all people in His image sent a Savior for all the peoples, for all the nations, and it is the only message which will save anyone. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, you're guardians of this message. As Paul finishes the book of 1 Timothy, now turn back to 1 Timothy with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up you know, where we should with 17 and following, but I, I just wanna, I'm going to show you the main final command that Paul gives in this book. Verse 20. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. By extension, this is Paul to Timothy, Timothy to the church. Close to 2,000 years later, you and me as Christians today too. I would say it this way, because Timothy, maybe we'll see him someday, I believe we will, in heaven. But because he's not here present with us today, I'll simply say this. Church, guard what's been entrusted to you. 1 Timothy 6.20. 1 Timothy 6.20. What's been entrusted to you? Something you don't own something you didn't make up, something you didn't define. It is the gospel. And what is the gospel? It's the only message that saves people. It's the very power and wisdom of God. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And who's it for? All nations. Church. I, you know, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to just because it's contemporary, but I really don't want to because I don't want to diminish the power and meaning of the message. But Guardians of the Galaxy has nothing on this. We're guardians of the gospel. We're guardians of the message that will save people's souls if we know what to do with it. First of all, you have to, I have to believe it. 
And we have to guard it against false teachers on the inside, like Hymenaeus and Alexander. And we have to guard it against false teachings on the outside. The, the gospel is an exclusive message. No one, no one will be saved apart from Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to heaven apart from me. John 14, 6 and 7. But, but I think people who don't like us, who criticize against Christians who believe in one message for all people to be saved, people who don't like that, don't understand, but the message is also inclusive of anyone and everyone from every nation, tribe, and tongue, all peoples, who would believe. So it's an inclusive message, but the message is simply this. In order to be saved, you must repent and believe in Jesus who died and rose again for you. You must believe in him to be saved. So God provided a way for all to be saved. But the only way for anyone to be saved is through the one way. Church, you do not exist to engage in any other concern than this, the gospel. You exist for the gospel. We exist because the gospel brought us to life, the gospel brought us together, and the gospel will send us out to those who've never heard before. Guard it. Preach it. Believe it. Do not let it be destroyed. Do not let it be, do not let it rust, as it were. Do not let it be diminished. I mean, Matthias, man, if you give my watch back to me and you broke that, dude, you, you broke my watch. We're not going to see God one day and say, God, we changed your message to make it more palatable for other people because our world came against us and so we wanted to be more friendly to everybody. No, we should tell the LGBTQ community, which is no different than alcoholics, which is no different than people stuck on other addictions, men, men, repent from what you're looking at because there's kids in the room, I'm just going to leave it there. We're not anti-LGBTQ. We're not anti-Muslim. We're not anti. No, listen. God is anti-sin, or is he? I mean, he is. But he did something about it. You see. He did something about it. He died for that sin. So how can we, if we say we believe in Jesus Christ and He's paid for our sin, how can we still live in that sin? You can't. You can't. The gospel demands something of us. Repent from sin. Live a holy life. And, but even those things are things we cannot do in our own power. Only the Holy Spirit can give us the grace to do that. But church, you're infinitely more important than guardians of the galaxy. Because you're guardians of this gospel message. Do you believe it? We're going to redefine rich. Redefining rich. The second point today, that was my introduction. And it was really important because Paul gets to where he's talking about this deposit, but you have to know what the deposit is. You have to know what the treasure is. Redefine rich. Okay, read with me in 1 Timothy 6.17. Let's start, let's start where, where we, we left off. 1 Timothy 6.17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world. Two negatives and four positives. Watch. Instruct those who are rich in this present world, negative number one, not to be conceited. What does that mean? Don't be proud. Don't be haughty or cherish proud thoughts or feel proud. Uh, the rich are tempted to think that their great monetary value indicates that they themselves are of greater worth or value. George W. Knight. So, so Paul, and, and there, there's a hint here that in Ephesus, there might have been a certain constituency of the people in the church who are rich. Rich meaning they don't even have to work for a living. And, and he's saying to those, and, and these are believers in the church, so he's saying to them, you who are rich, don't be conceited. Don't be proud and think that your money is going to save you. Because he, Paul already said in this book earlier, Pastor Brother Evan preached on this, Right? 
Godliness with contentment is great gain, and we cannot take it with us. There's no U-Hauls behind hearses. Right? You can't take it with you. In a materialistic society such as America, we put a lot of stock in stock, and we put a lot of stock in money, and we think that we're something when we have more than others. And God, through his Holy Spirit, says to believers, don't be conceited that way. What's the other negative? Or, see it says not to be conceited or to fix, so, it's, so don't fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. That's the second negative. See, it, it, it's not just feeling puffed up, proud, conceited. It's the idea that because I'm rich, maybe somehow God's going to show favor to me. There's some hope in it some, in some way. But beautifully here, riches are called uncertain. Uncertain. The uncertainty of riches. Psalm 62.10 says, Do not trust in oppression and do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Stock market goes up and your 401k goes up and you're like, oh, I can relax now. I feel good. Stock market goes down and you lose, you know, how much? 50%. Oh, no. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them because they can't save you. Proverbs 23, 4. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. Man, that was a proverb. Man, that, that looks like the stock market. <laughs> Hey, we talk about godly stewardship here, and when we do so, we talk about using all things for God's glory. This is not against rich people. But this is against people putting their hope in something other than God. Watch. Jesus said in Luke 12, 19, using an illustration of a guy who, who will say to his soul, I, I love it when it says in Luke 12, 19, I will say to my soul, soul? It's right there. It's, 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 in, it's in the verse. It's really cool. You have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> this is a true story. My father-in-law, Pastor Wayne, um, he, was in, he, he, he was doing jail ministry, and he was in a jail, and a guy got put in jail because he had been drinking and having a good old time, and he got arrested. <laughs> and the guy quotes the Bible to Pastor Wayne. He says, well, doesn't the Bible say eat, drink, and be merry? Justifying why I'm behind bars and you're not? That isn't messed up. But Wayne was smart enough that he knew this verse. The very next verse, Luke 12, 20 says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. See, we're going to redefine riches this morning. I want every single human being in this room to be filthy, stinking rich. But it's not in the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, and I'm not talking about money. I want you to be rich toward God. Two things not to do. Don't be prideful or conceited and don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. What are the four things you should do? Paul goes on. Instruct them to, one, do good. Oh, wait, I've got to back up. I've got to back up. Middle of verse 17. You see, it's when, after it says fix their, uh, not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Fix your hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Okay, okay. First thing, set your hope on God, the supplier. So don't trust in the gift, trust in the giver. If you're rich, don't set your hope on riches. Set your hope on God. Then, instruct them to do good. So honor God with your hope, honor God with your deeds, do good. Be rich in good works. That's the third good thing to do, be rich in good works. And to be generous and ready to share, the end of verse 18, be generous and ready to share. Even Hebrews 13, 16, another verse in the Bible, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So taking 1 Corinthians 6, 17 through 19 all together, 
what's, what's, the, what's the summary of the teaching here? Put your hope in the giver, not in the gifts. What this means is that it is God who has granted you your wealth, if you're the wealthy one, and he has done so with a purpose so that you can honor and glorify the giver of all things through generosity. In so doing, you're emulating the very generosity of God. God's good gifts are given for us to enjoy. We're to share both our wealth and our lives. So he's not just talking about rich people and, and, and their riches per se. It also says do good deeds. See, if you're a Christian, that's more important than your money. Let me, let me, let me slow down. If you're a Christian, that's more important than your money. So live as a Christian. And let your good deeds also show that you're a Christian. The way you live, the way you serve. Thus we're truly rich. And this will lead to permanent treasure. You see, we're redefining rich here this morning. What do you mean, lead to permanent, permanent treasure? Look at verse 19. Storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. You see, Paul already told the man of God um, in, in just a few verses uh, uh, above uh, what we preached on the sermon before this one in Timothy um, to take hold of eternal life. And taking hold of life indeed carries with it that same concept, that same teaching. Take hold. America sells you a lie that you've got to get rich. And that's an idol. But God comes in 2,000 years ago and gives us an eternal principle, an eternal truth, and says, but your riches for anyone who believes are in Christ. If you're in Christ, whether your bank account is in the millions of dollars or in the tens of pennies, if you're in Christ, you're already rich. You're already rich. Take hold of that which is life indeed. Invest your time, talents, and treasure in building a foundation for your future things that are eternal. True treasure is not of this earth, but using all that we have here to build a foundation for true and lasting treasure in heaven. Take hold of your spiritual life, life indeed, real life. No one, this is powerful. Did, did you see it there in the verses? We're not supposed to fix our hope on uncertainty of riches. We're not supposed to be conceited if we have money, but we're supposed to fix our hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So where's richness? It's, it's in God. True richness is in God. And no one can outgive God. No one is more generous than God. And frankly, y'all, I, I understand that even the last few minutes I've been talking, I might could possibly be confused with a health, wealth, prosperity person. And, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that our life is not measured in dollars. Our life is measured by grace through faith in Christ and all that we live for, believe in, and do for him. That's what it's all about. God poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, Titus 3, 6. You know, uh, two weeks from today, two weeks from today, my firstborn son will be married for one day. He'll have a whole 24 hours already married. He and his wife-to-be are here in this room. Man, that's going to be awesome. Two weeks from today. And two weeks from today, their wedding's going to be on a Saturday. We'll be here in a congregational meeting on a Sunday, and we'll have an opportunity to practice what we're preaching, to be generous toward God when we as a church possibly decide about the parsonage that God has given us. We've already shared with the body our hopes and desires for what we want to do with what God has given us. And we want to glorify Him and worship discipleship and mission with all of it. Why? Because our God isn't money. Our God is Jesus Christ and we're going to serve Him in the mission. Now if you think I'm crazy, that's fine. I just want to read with you something. Now turn again in your Bibles to Matthew 16, or sorry, 6, Matthew 6, 19. 
Matthew 6, 19. Matthew 6, 19. You see, the second point of the message, I've, I've gone thus far and I've walked through 1 Timothy 17, uh, 6, chapter 6, verses 17, 18, 19, talking about how God's gospel treasure is deposited in the church, and God's gospel treasure is more important than worldly treasure. We're redefining treasure and truth here. Yeah, do y'all know what I'm doing? Okay, before I became a Christian, I, I would have said I love you to people, maybe my family, you know, maybe a romantic interest, I love you, before I became a Christian. But human love, fleshly love, was so defined on what I wanted. And after I became a Christian, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and repented of my sin and received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I, I'm reading the Bible, and one day I, I read this verse that says, greater love hath no man than he laid down his life for his friends. And I realized God's definition of love is different than my unsaved, fleshly, sinful definition of love. And God redefined love for me. See, God should redefine rich for us too. Be rich toward God. And it actually has nothing really to do with your money. It has to do with putting everything in your life in His hands. Redefine riches. Jesus said, I'm just going to read it. Matthew 6, 19 and following. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God and wealth. So pick one. And whichever one you pick is your God. That was my commentary. Verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon and all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God, who Paul in our text today calls the giver of all good things, of all things, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying... What will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So if I'm crazy then may I be crazy in the way that Christ taught. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 44, that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Paul says in Colossians, sorry, Colossians 2, their hearts, so that their hearts may be encouraged, Colossians 2, verse 2, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if we're redefining wealth today, where do you find all the treasures of God? It's in Christ. It's not in your bank account. 
and he has been given to us. So you see, the gospel is your salvation if you believe. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel is Christ in you. The gospel is the hope of glory. The gospel is for all nations. And God has given that gospel, deposited it in the church, and he wants his people not to be focused on worldly things like money, but to be focused on the greatest riches and treasure that God has ever given to the whole world. And what is that? It's the gospel itself. It's Jesus himself. And so he closes with these words. The church, guardians of the gospel, the last point today. In 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21. And this command... O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. You see, this gospel is so essential and so important and so life-giving that God put it in the church for the blessing of the whole world. And so guard it because it's the greatest treasure. Guard it more than you would guard all the gold at Fort Knox. Guard it more than you would guard anything else in our lives. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe. Guard it against false teachings. He says there in 1 Timothy 6, the one positive thing that we have to do by command is guard the deposit, guard the gospel, what's been entrusted to you, And then negatively, we're supposed to avoid. Avoid worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. He ends the letter with grace be with you, and it's plural for all of you. So part of the way we guard the gospel is we don't get taken off into a fight about things not to do with the gospel. We we avoid the worldly, godless chatter. Can I say it one more time, y'all? Avoid worldly, godless chatter. We don't exist to enter into arguments over a hundred different things. We exist to guard the gospel. He said in 1 Timothy 1, at the beginning of the book, verse 18, this command, I entrust to you, an entrustment, giving a stewardship to Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and, sh- and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. See, we either guard the gospel and it leads to life, or the gospel goes to false teaching and false teachers and godless chatter of the day, and if that happens, that leads to shipwreck of faith. And the key central passage of the book, 1 Timothy 3.15. In case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. The pillar and support of what truth? The gospel of Almighty God. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in the flesh. Jesus, God in the flesh. Was vindicated in the spirit, raised again from the dead. Seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, the mission and message is for all peoples. Believed on in the world and taken up in glory. This is why the church exists. To guard this gospel that it has been given to us. In First Timothy, or sorry, Second Timothy now, we'll see later on uh, in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13, a parallel passage to today's passage. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Guard it. Guard it. So I just want to leave us as we finish this book with something of a pastoral commitment to you from me. I'll lump in Brother Evan, but I didn't tell him I was going to say this, so you can define as you wish, but I think we're together on this. Pretty much 100% sure. We're We're going to be about this gospel. The church is about the gospel. We're not going to get off the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. We're going to glorify Christ in worship, discipleship, and mission. It's worship of God because we've been saved through the gospel. It's discipleship of believers who are in the gospel. And it's mission of the gospel to those who haven't heard. It's all about the gospel. And people might think we're foolish. 
Because we're not going to do things the way the world does things. I'm going to share a story with you as we conclude. It comes from Mark 10. You can open there if you'd like to follow along. Mark 10, verse 17. Oftentimes when an encounter happened in the life of Jesus, people kind of, they leave it a little bit too short. I'm going to explain something to you. In Mark 10, 17, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks a key question. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's called the rich young ruler uh, because you know, he himself was likely somehow involved in the synagogue teaching. Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. And then Jesus does something phenomenal. He does something powerful here, which we kind of miss because we don't have Jewish background. I just want to explain it to you. So a rich young ruler of the Jews who has a lot of money comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus starts with what we call the second table of the Ten Commandments. You have the Ten Commandments. The first four deal with God's relationship with God. Directly, direct God's commands about him and himself. No other gods, no idols. Don't take his name in vain. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's God word, okay? But what Jesus does with this Jewish ruler is he starts with the second table of the Ten Commandments. It says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your mother and father. So Jesus goes to the relationship commands that deal with other people. There's something to that. Watch what happens. The rich young ruler says to Jesus, teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. I've kept the law. So I get eternal life, right? I did good, Papa. So I get the cake, right? Jesus said, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. So Jesus wanted to define rich for this guy. But I think when Jesus said that, one thing you lack, you see he went from the second table of the Ten Commandments up to the first table. You shall have no other gods before me. One thing you lack, go sell your God. Go get rid of your possessions. Come follow me. Discipleship. These words saddened the rich young ruler, it says in Mark 10, 22. He went away grieving because he owned much property. The rich young ruler made a decision to worship his money. The rich young ruler was actually very poor. Now, if we stopped at that story, that is a biblical teaching. What a phenomenal understanding. But you see, the text doesn't even stop there. And we shouldn't stop there. Because watch what happens. This is phenomenal that the disciples, it goes on in 10.23, Mark 10.23, Jesus looking around said to his disciples how hard it is, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. Jesus answers and says again to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Um, I think that was a parable. There's, it's not the gate, the, ga the, the, the needle gate with the camels having to be, no, he's saying a camel to go through an eye of a needle. It's easier, easier than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because rich men worship their money instead of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Now watch, because they just, the disciples just asked the same question that the rich man asked. How can I get eternal life? Who can be saved? Mark 10, 27, looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible. You can't be saved. Impossible. Unless God does it. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. That doesn't mean that you can jump a motorcycle into a sanctuary service. All things are possible with God. That was an article that came out some years ago, and the pastor died when he tried it. That's stupid to say all things are possible with God and then do something stupid. What we're saying is only salvation in the gospel is possible with God. Peter, Mark 10, 28 says, 
he began to say to Jesus, watch. So, see, because what you have in this teaching is you have the rich young ruler compared to Peter. you got to keep going through the text. Peter says, behold, we've left everything and followed you. The disciples. Remember Peter? Fishing with his dad and his brother, and Jesus said, come follow me. Remember that? And Peter left everything and followed Jesus. Remember? So Peter was poor. Itinerant disciples, itinerant Jesus, walking around, his disciples following around, no homes. Oh, well, let, me, let, me, let me explain, because Peter himself, wow, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, what? Eternal life. You see, you have to get to Mark 10, 30 to get the answer to the rich young ruler's question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the rich young ruler goes away from Jesus because he worships his God, wealth, more than he worships Jesus. So the rich young ruler was really poor. But the poor disciples who left everything and followed Christ, they have eternal life. So the poor disciples are actually really... Now you know the definition of rich. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be rich. I pray that we would follow you not half-heartedly, but 100%. I pray that we would guard the gospel. I pray that we would give all of our time, talent, and treasure, not just a percentage, but because you are the giver of everything and everything we have, life and breath and all of our possessions are given by you. May we so live our lives that everything we are is for you and your kingdom and your glory. Only the gospel is worthy of this kind of life, given, because only the gospel has the power to give life to sinners. Lord Jesus, bless us as your household of God to guard the gospel, and we will give it back to you in stewardship. In Jesus' name. Matthias, can I have my watch back? Thank you. Is it still working? It's still working. Timex keeps on ticking. Takes a licking. One day, we'll say, Lord Jesus, you deposited your gospel in us. Here's what we did with it.